staff to make sure they could do the documentation, the production, coordination, all that kind of stuff. So just to kind of um, to kind of delve into that just a little bit more, there's this kind of thing which is actually I've taken the credit off. I used to use the credit for this. This comes from something somebody did a few years ago, actually, uh, in the states about uh, five stages of Revit, but I've translated it slightly into five stages of BIM because it, you know it's not really Revit specific. Um, well, I forgot the credit. Anyway. Um, so just as a kind of talking about the mindset and the kind of people's process going through this project is that everyone starts out, once they're on board, there's kind of initial resistance, then once they're on board, there's kind of like, wow, this is great, look at all this thing going, produce a 3D building, and it's kind of got drawings coming out of it, and it's like, wow, this is cool. And then uh, something doesn't quite work, it's like, oh, I could just do this so much quicker when I was doing it, okay, why do I have to do it this way, why do you make me, why? <laughs> Real frustration, and that's quite difficult when you've got a senior burst on a project starting to vent about something midway through a project. Believe me, when I'm the person there, has got to answer their questions and give them the kind of counselling they need to get over it. Um, they get beyond that though, and then they get to this kind of stage where everything's running smoothly and everything's fine. It's like, wow, this is going like clockwork, this is great, now I know what I'm doing. And I feel like I've got my old skills back, I can kind of turn out the drawings, I can do my designs, I can show up 3D, I can you know, slice and dice the model, turn out a schedule, anything I want to do. Then, they start developing their own components <laughs> and thinking, Actually, the stuff that comes with Revit in our case, or comes with Archicad or whatever, comes with it, you know, that's not really the way I want that piece of furniture to look, or it's really not the way I want that door to work. I really want to model it myself and make sure it works properly. It's like, how, how do I do that? And that's quite interesting when you see people go through that stage because they're kind of committed and they really see the benefits at that point, but it's kind of, <laughs> and then once they get over that, then there's kind of a nice one, you know, just rolls from then on. <laughs> Well, it's nice to think that would be the way it goes through. You know, obviously the cycle kind of repeats at different stages and you kind of get more bumps and more things. But it's kind of observing people going through it and talking to other people and other practices. Everyone kind of goes through a cycle which is a little bit like this, this kind of excitement and trap challenge then, you know, kind of developing. And you can kind of map this and you can kind of say, you know, their skills are developing, but the kind of mind frame or emotional thing is kind of going up and down by extreme as you're going through this process. It's probably a bit like when you first learn your partner's going to have a baby or you're going to have a baby, you're kind of like, oh, that's exciting, and it's, oh, shit, <laughs> what have I got to adjust to? You know, this is all different to what I expected. So it's kind of a, a bit of up and down. But then depending on who's, who's in this journey, if you map out a student, you know, their cycle is actually much easier because, like I said, they're unlearning less. They're kind of open to this and they're just, you know, crack on. It's, you know, it's a bit difficult, okay, we'll get over that, carry on. Not too bad. It's really the, it's the more experienced architect, you know, they kind of get up and they're like, oh, it's all down. It's like, oh, why do I have to do this now? Can I just, you know, can I do it the old way? And uh, so it's an interesting kind of uh, thing because everyone kind of tends to think BIM software, change, you know, just learn some new stuff, get on with it. But actually there's a whole kind of emotional kind of mindset. Everything kind of goes on in the company. And if you've got a big team, like I was saying, this is like a third of our office work on a project. They're all kind of going up and down the cycle slightly differently. But everyone comes down to tea, sits around the table together, one person sitting in the corner kind of cursing and everyone's going, oh, I hope we don't have to do that on our project. And uh, it becomes quite critical in terms of you know, how the perception is across the office. So moving on then to going beyond that. So pretty much we decided that it's going to go forward with BIM before we finished the project. You know, we actually started doing other projects even while this one was still ongoing because the benefit had been seen. So there's kind of expanded internal uptake and people worked on this project, moved on to something else, they're like, right, I'm gonna do this, this is what I want to do. Um, while other people in the office saw what was being done and thought, well, our project could really do with the benefits they've got, why, you know, we want to use it on our project also. So it's quite a, quite a good uh, uptake. I mean, I would say that, you know, eight years or seven and a half years down the line now, we're not 100% BIM in either office now, we're kind of 80% in one office and probably 30-40% in the other office. And it's, you know, it's a slow process because there's a lot more to it than just what people want to do on the project. There's, you know, there's lots of factors involved in changing a company that much. And then there's kind of external demand. So we started to see contracted clients and uh, local authority clients and they started to say, look, we really want this project delivered in BIM. And uh, suddenly people started, in the office, started to contact me and say, clients talk about BIM, can we do that or can't we do that? Is it, can we offer that service? And it, it moved, it was quite interesting because it moved from me pushing everything to people starting to ask me and say, you know, we think we need to do this, clients are asking for it, so you know, what, what are we going to do? And then there was 
the wider design team and this kind of government push towards level two BIM with all the consultants working on models and that. So first project, we talked to our structural engineer and our M&E services engineers. They said, I don't think we're ready for that yet. <laughs> structural engineer said, yeah, we've got somebody in the office that does that, but not on this project, please. And um, we did push that and we did show them why we wanted them to do that. We did talk to them quite a lot, did kind of evangelizing as it were. And on subsequent projects, we have had the same engineers that we used for structures and building services on that have now started to work with us using, uh, using the BIM process together. So just some sort of examples and looks at other ways we used it. So I said before about area schedules. So this is a project where we were doing the bidding for. We didn't win it, so we didn't even get, get to go anywhere. We didn't get paid for it. We are just working on the bid side of it. Um, this is a secondary school, so you can see here just a general arrangement plan of the secondary school. And then this is a schedule. So the schedule is live reporting from what's in there. Now a model, when we're talking about BIM, the digital model is actually a database. It's not a CAD file. And the database has different ways of viewing it. So you have a graphical interface for your database, essentially. And then you have a numerical interface for your database, essentially. So these are looking at the same thing. So if on here you update a reference on a door, you're actually updating the data which is in the background. And it's just showing on that drawing, it's showing the schedule the same. So it's really, that's kind of, you know, thinking about how you're doing things is a bit different in that sense. So what we did in this is we just set up a bunch of parameters. So you've got all your rooms, which are, you know, you position your rooms. Your rooms are kind of three-dimensional objects as such, filling a space. Give them a briefing here, say, we know this room must be this area. And then just put some equations into the schedule which just say, check it from what's really on there against what we know it should be. Tell us, is it more or is it less? So you can see there's some highlighted red, so it's just saying, you know, filter it. If it's more, stick a red color on so we know. So while somebody's working on that, they just need to flip over to this view. They can just check, oh, okay, I know those rooms are still too big. Go back and have a little, you know, carry on with this thing. And this actually was one of the processes that really sold it for one of our directors. Because they were working on this bid, very small group of people working very hard, late nights, everything going hard out to try and win this. Unfortunately, didn't as I said. Um, architects working there, doing this, and the guy, then the director comes along and says, How are we doing on the area? And he says, Well, we're still not quite there, and you know, flip over the schedule, show them and then kind of move that around, see the, see the schedule. And oh, I think oh, we can just move in, you know, just move these walls in a little bit, and then it will do it, kind of do it live, you know, like five minutes job, quick tweak, see the update. Director's like, that's really, really valuable when we're doing this kind of stuff. You know, architects' work might be about the kind of aesthetics and the visuals quite a lot of the time, but actually getting this kind of stuff is what wins you a job, making sure it's actually on the brief from the client's point of view. And then on the same one, as I talked about before, level of detail when you're modeling is really important so you don't waste time on stuff which has got no value. And so you see this model is really rough and ready. It's just walls, it's got some rooms chucked in, it's got a few doors just to make sure you know, the plan looks right. You see the section, very crude, there's hardly any detail in there at all. But that was giving us the information we needed. It's producing the plans which we're using the bid, and it's producing the schedules which we're using for the area management. Really important. But that is a few hours worth of modeling. If they started to go through, put roofs, put window, you know, you could go on forever to develop that as a beautiful model which served no purpose. <laughs> and then uh, the designing side of things. So looking at, uh, and there's another project at the primary school. It's just like looking at how things like structure and space and furniture, all that kind of stuff integrates. It's a bit like the visualization for clients early on. So you can get this out of the model at any point. It's really useful for communicating, understanding, consulting, working together to develop the design to make sure it's going where you want it to. But also not just the kind of nice visuals or the more sort of architectural visuals, is that we're modeling the kind of structure. You know, we're not doing structural engineering, but we'll stick the structure in where it affects us. So we can kind of visualize that, and that helps everyone involved in the process understand what's going on with it also. And then this is looking at ceiling voids and things as well, because the en engineers on this one were not doing stuff in 3D or anything re remotely kind of bit. And, um, you know, they sent us drawings for sprinkler layouts and for uh, water distribution stuff, and you can't put your pipes there, there's no space. <laughs> so we kind of produce drawings like this, and then show it to them and say, look, actually, this is where your roots can go, this is how it works, so they then understand the design, and we can work with them much better. And then the other side of it is that, you know, you can have just a crude output from a model like this, which you can do anywhere you want to model, and then this is just a Photoshop over the top of that, so it's just like, you know, you're not stuck on necessarily producing, you know, use it as a tool that communicates the way you want to communicate. And on this, in this situation, these were, um, 
for a school in Wales who's going to the Design Commission for Wales for a review. So we wanted to have it as a much more friendly, kind of uh, sketchy kind of feel to it. We didn't want to kind of produce something that looked like it was from a computer, but you know, it's still a computer drawing, it's just a little bit of, actually I think it was even hand traced and then scanned in Photoshop. Just, you know, you can use the tool to support your processes, you're not kind of needing to do it a particular way necessarily. And then level two, so just to sort of talk a bit about some of the stuff we've done with this, um, is, like I said at the beginning, this is where you get all the consultants, all the people involved, producing their own model, integrating that, checking, coordinating, working together. So this is a model for a hospice in Herefordshire, near to our offices. And this building is an existing building being refurbished, and then from here on it's all new build. And this is a project that was developed in 2D CAD for the first stage of it. And then this is one where the architect was working on that, looked at the BIM site and said, look, we've just got to move this, we can't keep doing this in 2D. The geometry, the junctions, you know, they're working all this out. Can you imagine doing an elevation for every single facet of that building manually by hand? It's just a time-consuming process. And any time you revise it, so many drawings, it's just a lot of coordination. So this one got moved over to BIM at uh, post stage D, so once planning had gone in, it was then started to get modelled. And then um, we got, we also got the consultants insisted that when the client tendered the consultants that they required that it was done in BIM. Some of the engineers dropped out at that point, we got other ones in, but uh, that was fine. And um, so you can see here, it's a bit dark again, I'm sorry, but uh, there's the architectural model, there's the structure, you can see kind of beams going through, and then there's the services with the pipes, and it's kind of classic. This is the kind of stuff that goes on in design that quite often gets resolved on site, which is very, very unfortunate and costly when it happens on site. So this is the kind of beta testing of your building in that sense. It's like, this is what we think, try it out, doesn't work. Let's solve it now rather than later when they're building it and then it gets really expensive. You know, it's an order of magnitude of you know 10 or 100 when you make a mistake in a design compared to when you mistake, make a mistake on the site in terms of uh, cost. And there's just another view of a similar kind of thing where you can see things going through beams. So you know they're stepping down but they're still not underneath it. So there's still more work they need to do there. And this is kind of the, the basic, most simple kind of benefit of working collaboratively in three-dimensional and uh, with a certain degree of the kind of data side of it as well, but really just the kind of three-dimensional side of working together. And that's really the end of the second section, just talking about our adoption of BIM. So the next section is um, talking about BIM and Passive House, which is a bit shorter and a little bit more focused around the Passive House side of things, um, which is, uh, works very well with BIM. But if anyone's got any kind of questions or wanted to just say anything about that stage, yeah, go for it. Um, go back to your pilot project, yeah. Willows. Um, you said you were working on it for about six years or so. Mm. Um, how did technology change over that period of time and how would it affect you? Yeah, um, when, when, over that period of time, software probably went through about six different versions. <laughs> and BIM software won't allow you to go backwards in it. So if you upgrade it, you can't then open it in the old version. So you've got to be careful if you want to upgrade, you'll make sure you go forwards, not try and go backwards. Um, and in this, on that project, we started it in one version and we ended it about three versions later or something. And we made a conscious choice not to upgrade at that point and not to, you know, it was a big project, a lot of complication in the model. We just weren't sure that we wanted to spend any time checking if we upgraded, if everything went through with integrity. So we didn't. So that's in, um, I don't know what version I've it now, a few years back anyway. So. Uh, so that was one thing, and the, the versions of software do come with more benefits and more um, tools and things in them. So we did see some advantages in that to a certain degree. But other than that, because we were really just working on, on our own, we didn't really see a lot of change in the technology or the advantages. If we'd been working with the engineers and the, the building services and structural engineers and things, or we got them part way through, then there might have been more change visible. And also, at that stage, the contractor just had no interest in BIM whatsoever. And so there's, you know, the te in that time, the technology evolved that they could have had a model on an iPad potentially. They could have checked stuff in 3D on site and, and looked at and uh, interrogated the model, you know, selected something on an iPad and checked what the kind of properties, you know, whether the door was meant to be fire rated or not, all that kind of stuff. But they just weren't interested. They weren't. You know, the contractors in the UK have really only started taking it up when they know they had to. <laughs> and, you know, they've kind of pushed the PR line that they've been leading on the BIM side, I think, for a while now. But, you know, the big contractors have been doing a lot with BIM on the project where they've had to, or where they've seen a really good commercial advantage. Yeah, 
yeah. So not too not too many changes on the technology side. Um, what made you go with uh, Revit at the time? Um, a couple of things was that we looked, essentially we looked at Revit, we looked at Archicad, which is Graphisoft's equivalent, and we looked at uh, Bentley Systems, which had, um, I can't remember what it's called, anyway, Bentley, whatever the Bentley thing was at the time, which is now Ecosyn. Sort of Sorry? Yeah, it was. I'm not sure if it was MicroStation or MicroStation with generative components or something, but anyway, it was the Bentley code. We looked at the three of them because they were the three key kind of offerings for an architecture sort of thing. And we made the decision to use Revit for a couple of reasons. And it was quite a difficult decision in some ways because we're a Mac based office. Revit doesn't run on Macs, so we had to invest in parallel software. And in fact, the Macs we were running at the time, you couldn't even run Windows on. So we had to kind of go through the cycle of upgrading hardware to get the right chipsets in it so we could run Windows, because Macs previously were on a different chipset and then they moved to Intel so they could run Windows. And to get some parallel software, install Windows on that and then install Revit on that. So it was quite a kind of cost and kind of mentality challenge because everyone's kind of there. We're, win we're a Mac based firm, we don't want to use Windows. <laughs> so we have to. Um, I'm sure you know all about Mac fanboys and the like. Um, so that was the challenge side. The reasons were really that Revit looks to be the industry leader. That was one side. There was also, at that point, already the building services and the structural engineer version of Revit available. So we knew we were going to be able to collaborate directly without kind of translation problems with consultants. Um, and the other one was, well, the other, another one was that I personally used Revit for quite some time before then, so I could demonstrate and show you how to do it. And then, there's a few other things like Revit. Um, if you want to model a component in Revit, you use a visual interface like you do in the project interface for Revit. So you extrude a kind of solid object, you put parameters on, all that kind of stuff, much as you would in the project. If you use something like Archicad, you've got to learn GDL scripting language, and you've got to code, you know, write scripting or uh, computer language to actually create a component, which you know some people find about doing that kind of thing, but I. I didn't really think there was the right way to go for an architectural practice to insist that people have to learn how to code just to you know, make a desk that they wanted to look different than their model. So it was the other kind of key to it. And, um, and there's a few, there's just a few other capability differences between Revit and the other software which I thought were important for the way we wanted to do things on our project. And I know there's other architects out there that use Bentley products, use Archicad products, and even Vectorworks now that people are using that for kind of them to some degree and doing so very successfully. So, you know, it's, it really should be for who you know, to suit whatever the company's needs are. So that was our choice to suit us really. It's three o'clock already. We're right for another twenty minutes or something like that or so. Anyone bored want to leave this morning? So can I ask one more question? Yeah, go for it. Um, if you can't specify a particular file type that you'd like the project to live in, would you look to either convert the file from what you currently use as your sort of software platform, or would you actually change software platform and make it easier to deliver to the <laughs> format that they would That's like? a good question. Um, I think it would depend on the project. If it, was, if it was plausible to do a translation, we'd model them what we use and deliver it and what they wanted. If it was project that had enough funding on it, we might consider changes to different software to suit that project. Um, I know some large practices do that, and that I know some big practices have changed from one to another. Like I know one example um, that was pretty much committed to Bentley, and then the clients said they wanted Revit files, and they, had, they chose to go invest in Revit for that project, which was a massive project, so probably, probably got the money and the time to do that, I think. Um, but I would hope that it's a fairly unlikely scenario, actually. Because the government's output that they're looking for is a kind of um, standardised database format rather than a BIM authoring kind of format. So they're not asking for a Revit file or a DWG file or that kind of thing. They're asking for COBE, which is a structured form of data, or IFC, which is Industry Foundation Classes, which is you know a way of translating between different software types or producing output. So yeah, we could deliver IFC or COBE if that's what they wanted, but yeah. And that's the kind of aim, I think, and the most, most part of the industry is kind of pushing to say, 
don't tell us to deliver a software specific format. We're happy to deliver a generic format, otherwise, you know, <laughs> let us do our job the way we'd like to do it. Right, so BIM and Passive House. Maybe a little bit off topic if people are just more interested in knowing about BIM. Uh, Passive House is a standard that's uh, not particularly related to BIM, but uh, also uh, moving forward very fast in the country at the moment, being taken up across the industry and people starting to realise the benefits and importance of it. Um, Passive House standard was developed in Germany by a German building scientist and a uh, Swedish building scientist in the early 90s. Um, got 20 odd years of collected data from built buildings to show that it's reliable, things do what they say they do. These building scientists were looking at uh, so called eco buildings across Europe, looking at them and saying, why don't these buildings perform? Why are they uncomfortable? Why do they still use more energy than they said they were going to? Why are they not living up to their promises? They can't not obey the laws of physics, they're still a building. So, what are the laws of physics that they're not paying attention to? What, you know, why is it working? So, it's a very rigorous standard, it's a performance standard, so it doesn't say you've got to use it in concrete or brick or timber or whatever, it's really about the, out the outcomes, the performance of the building. It's uh, got a very rigorous quality assurance aspect to it, so the design, the energy modelling and the building as it gets constructed get checked by third parties to make sure that what's built is what's designed, what's designed is accurately correct and not you know, fudged in the energy model or in the details. Um, it's also actually a comfort standard, and actually there's more criteria to meet passive house that are in human comfort than there are in energy consumption. So energy consumption is a couple of benchmarks for uh, the amount of heating or cooling energy needed for the building, and benchmark for the total amount of primary energy. So primary energy is the amount of energy generated, not the amount of energy consumed. So if you generate energy in a nuclear power station, so much is generated, you lose a bit through the process, you lose a bit through the national grid distributing it, and then you use a certain amount of the building. Primary energy is what is generated, not what you use. So it's kind of factorised up. So you know you might use a certain amount, but actually the amount generated needs to be you know one and a half times that amount just so you can use that. So it's, it's measuring actual energy, primary energy, and uh, it's climate specific. So uh, wherever you want to design a building anywhere in the world, it needs accurate climate data for that precise location. So if you're designing a building in Wales, or if you're designing a building in Wolverhampton, like we've been doing. They're using different climate data sets because they're different climates, even that close together, as opposed to some other standards and things out there, which you know, the UK might have two or three weather uh, zones, and that's, that's kind of what you use, so it's much more specific than that. The tool that you use in Passive House for the design process and for the energy modelling process is called the Passive House Planning Package, PHPP. And you know, arguably it is a kind of building information model because you're putting information about building into what is a numerical model. So it's not a graphical model like a digital building. It's a numerical model like a, more like a traditional kind of database. Um, you tend to interact with it as a spreadsheet. Um, or sometimes it's referred to as a BEM, a building energy model. <laughs> um, although it's not just energy, as I said, it's got a lot of comfort and other geometry criteria and things. So arguably I'd say it's more of a building information model. PHPP is designed very precisely by the building scientists who did the initial study and then set up the Pacifist Institute. Um, it's very clear about using the right data and using it in the right way and not putting in stuff which is superfluous, but making sure you do put in things that are right. So for an example, if you use uh, SAP calculations for UK building regulations, which is energy, energy modelling for part L, if you look at something like a window like that, they're just looking at that as a window. It's a certain size, it's got a certain U value, it performs in a certain way. If you're doing that in a passive house, you look at that as a window, you look at the number of mullions, you look at the number of transoms, you look at the thermal bridging around the frame, the frame detail, the performance of the frame, the performance of the glass, the performance of the wall adjacent to it, how much shading is there, all these kind of things, because these are the things that actually impact on how that window performs. You know, because Passive House is absolutely focused on making sure it does it properly. So if you design something, it does what it says it does. Something like SAP is a very crude tool which is designed for the purpose of compliance with the regulations and nothing else. It's not designed to predict actual performance of buildings or things like that. So it's not fair to compare PHPP with SAP. You know, they're trying to do different things. But let's just try to give an example of you know, the levels of accuracy and the information that needs to go into this and to get them right. Um, PHPP is also brilliant because it's open. Because it is a spreadsheet format when you use it, 
There's no kind of hidden stuff going in the background. There's no kind of off in a cloud and some proprietary software uh, resellers or producers kind of company. Everything's right there in front of you. You can see it. Um, it's parametric, so if you update something about that window, then it'll immediately update with what the energy performance, what the comfort performance is. You know, everything is interactive in that sense. So very much like when you're working in a Revit model, you update something, it's parametric, so the interacts and updates. The same with PHPP. And also it's instant, which is, um, you know, people like Autodesk and I think some of the other ones as well, there's more kind of more independence now, but Autodesk has been a big player. And now putting a lot of stuff out in the cloud. So you can now render a model in the cloud, press a button, it uploads the data, so it renders it and sends it back to you. So it doesn't take up any of your computing time, which is brilliant. It's really good service. But if you're doing energy modeling, which they also offer as a cloud service, it still takes time, even though realistically it's taking a lot less time than if you're trying to do that through your own uh, energy um, software in your own office. But PHPP is instant because it is just a database and a spreadsheet, it's updating as you go. So it means you can tweak it, play with it, check things out, use it as an interactive design tool. You're not pressing something and then waiting. So from our point of view, brilliant. From an architect's point of view, when you really get to be able to use it and interact with it in an intelligent kind of way, don't feel like it's dictating what you've got to do for your design, then uh, it's really great because it's giving you up-to-date feedback all the time. And then, as I talked about, Passive House has really got a really strong sense of quality assurance about it. You know, this. There's no kind of getting out, you can't kind of tick a few boxes and get a passive house certification. It really will have to be checked thoroughly by an independent certifier to make sure it does uh, what it says it does. And if you remember the circle I showed at the very beginning about BIM, which is like the model and the data that goes from stage to stage of a project life cycle, and the information transfers with the model so people got the right information when they need it in the right format, PHPP and passive house is really much doing the same thing and saying we need the right information, it needs to be in the model in the right place to do the right kind of job. So there's a really kind of good synergy between those two in that sense, we find. So it's, uh, you know, BIM, Passive House, both of them really about a process, that kind of going through the whole life cycle of the project. It's not about ticking a box. And uh, I promise I won't kind of rant off about Bria or anything like that, but that is, you know, ticking a box to comply with something. Whereas Passive House is really about designing something and doing the design process. Um, it's really about information, you know, People, people produce absolutely fantastic renderings and things out of BIM, but you know you can produce an absolutely fantastic rendering out of any 3D package. It doesn't necessarily mean it's BIM. Uh, likewise, for energy and comfort performance, you see a lot of sexy thermographic kind of images <laughs> showing uh, heat, uh, what do you call it, uh, contours and different colours, you know, that range from yellow to purple, all that kind of stuff, and lovely pie charts and bar graphs, all that, showing how much energy is used, how much carbon dioxide, you know, all that stuff looks beautiful, but it's absolutely useless, absolute waste of time, and less the numbers of the data is accurate, unless you know it's accurate. So, no sexy graphics, nothing that doesn't cut it for passive house. And then the final one is what I talked about a bit earlier, is this kind of idea that you might beta test or test what you're doing in a digital form before you build it. In too often, energy details, where we've got thermal bridging or where we're, where we're building something about the installation, too often we kind of do a drawing and hope, it gets built one way on site, and then later on we find out what happens in the building. So Passive House is really saying that's not good enough. If you want to have performance that delivers what you're designing and what you're promising, you need to get it right in the model. You need to test it in the model stage. Uh, making any change on site, always far more expensive, always far more difficult. So when we first started doing Passive House, which was uh, four or five years ago now, I think when we first started doing Six, six years ago, I think we started doing Passive House. Um, we looked at that, and we looked at what we're doing with BIM, and we said, look, these are two different processes. We think they're going to work together well. We want them to work together to our benefit, but we don't want to get off in kind of developing something and putting a lot of effort into making something work for something else if it's not going to deliver any value to us. So we said, how can we do it in a really straightforward way to make it work as a design process rather than, you know, trying to make, trying to bend software to your will to do something else. So, try to keep it straightforward and really broke it down into two areas. It's like looking at the model, you know, visual interrogation, looking at something visually, seeing what you can learn from that. And the other one is just getting numbers out of the model and making sure that they're live, so as the model and the design evolves, the numbers are live, and making sure it's accurate, so you're not worrying about you know, double checking something that's been hand measured. <coughs> so breaking that down a bit further, visual interrogation, 
the things that we worked out we could do is we could really look at the design coordination integration, which is you know one of the core benefits of BIM, which is talked about a lot. It's often talked about as clash detection, which is kind of a slightly backwards notion in my mind because you really want to be coordinating first rather than waiting for a clash and then trying to detect it and figure it out later. But anyway, uh, three, so three-dimensional coordination integration with structures particularly, so you don't have structure going through your thermal envelope, you know, beams going through insulation, you know, that is a way of losing heat, it's a way of uh, risking mould and condensation inside your building. Um, and with the building services also, pipes, ducts, all that kind of stuff, making sure it's integrated in the design and making sure that building services and architecture structure is really one kind of design. And this is something that as a practice we've really worked on all the time, is having this kind of idea of integrated design, and not that if an architect does a design, hands it over and a building services engineer sticks up pipes and ducts in it where they can squeeze them in and begs the architect for more space to fit them in, or the engineer tries to prop the building up some way to stop it falling over. We really see it as an integrated process, and we really see that it helps in that process. Thermal continuity, so just make sure that insulation joins up everywhere, it doesn't have gaps in it, doesn't have things getting in the way of it. And then the heat loss envelope, it's really just the areas of the building that lose heat because in the UK the biggest source of energy use in a building is really the heating or in an office or teaching building like this it's probably the cooling in the, in the summer months and the heating in the winter months. So it's really that, that part of the building envelope that matters.